Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. We're going to forego the review this week. In fact, I'm going to forego the review because what we're doing is we're putting the previous week in your bulletin, um, the review for the previous week in your bulletin. And so if you open up your bulletin, there's a sheet in there and it has the review page for last week in it um, with all the information on it. So you can read through that and help you to refresh your memory as far as what we talked about last week uh, about... uh, being not afraid of sudden fear, neither the desolation of the wicked when it cometh, for the Lord shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Amazing verse of scripture. Hold on to it. Put that on your fridge. Remember that. It'll be a good one to have around for the year, for sure. Today we're in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 27 through 29. If you are having a hard time seeing these slides, they're on our Facebook page. You can look at them on your device, whatever you have on you, if you want to. Um, Withhold not good from them who it is due, when it is in the power of thine hand to do it. Say not unto thy neighbor, go, and come again, and tomorrow I will give, when thou hast it by thee. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. There's a a, a lot to unpackage here, as is per our usual arrangement, um, but there is some really amazing stuff here today. And, and what it boils down to is the conversation will be about our neighbor's benevolence in general and our responsibility to those particular entities. Um, benevolence is not something that we talk about oftentimes in Baptist circles, because, or in Christian circles, I should say, because I think that there is a there's a perceived kind of assumption that we are all just being benevolent, that we are all being uh, a giving people, or that we're all being charitable. Uh, and I think that there's some interesting things to think about when we start thinking about the idea of Christian charity, Christian benevolence, what that looks like to not only the stranger, but also to the people that are close to us as well. Um, and what are individual roles in that? What is the church's role in that? How is that affected our society, the church's approach to giving and benevolence, because it has affected society. Um, There's a lot of factors involved in this idea of benevolence, and a lot of questions, too, because benevolence is hard. Um, Giving is hard. Charity is hard, because there's all kinds of of questions that come up to, to kind of throw roadblocks in front of us as far as, you know, like, when do we give? How do we give? Who do we give to? You know, is it right to do X, Y, and Z while you're giving? You know, so we're going to approach some of these issues today. Um, just like yesterday, we're not going to solve all of the world's problems today. Um, but we are going to attempt to give us a baseline kind of starting point for us to venture into learning more about what it looks like to be a Christian and to be a giving Christian. And I'm not talking about necessarily giving to the church. I'm talking about charity and benevolence. Um, One of the things that we really, really hold to in our congregation and our church is the idea of a lot of benevolence. We love to give to our community. Um, And we want to do more. Uh, We don't want to do less of that. We want to do more of that. I think that when we are entrusted with the money that you give to the church, that you give that money not only to support the church itself, but to support the ministries of the church. And one of the most important ministries that we have is caring for our community and helping our community and helping one another out. All of these things are really important. So there's some philosophies that go along with that, Um, and right now we're going through a process of revamping some of our benevolence policies, and um, and after today's message, Ken's going to have to go back and rewrite it all, Um, and so he's pretty thrilled about that, Uh, but there's a lot of of concepts, um, right or wrong, that are built into the idea of charity. So let's take a look at them. The first part of the first verse, uh, uh, verse number 27 of chapter number 3, it says, Withhold not good from them to whom it is due. Again, I will remind you that I use the King James Version because I think it is the best literal version available. Um, There are some other versions of the Bible that are crossbreeds between a literal and a dynamic or, or dynamic equivalency. Um, but I like to be able to open my Bible up and to be able to see a, as close as possible 
the literal translation of the verse. In other words, I don't want the translator trying to explain to me what the author intended for me to hear. I want to see the words, and then I want the Holy Spirit to tell me what God wants me to hear. Um, and so when I'm reading through this, and you notice that it's King James, guys, don't freak out. It's not that complicated, okay? It's just takes a little bit more work to understand, which is the beauty of it, right? It's like learn to study, to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, which is what we'll be doing here today. Withhold not. The idea of deny, don't deny or don't hold back, don't keep it from them, right? It's this idea that it is a conscious decision that you are making. It's not like you don't have anything to give and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I need this, right? And you say, well, I don't have anything to give you. No, the concept here starts from this place that we are assuming that you have it in your pocket. So you got to start from there. The first thing is, right off the bat, there's an assumption that you have it to give. Now, this is the case with most Americans. Most of us don't carry around cash anymore because we have our debit card or whatever the case may be. And you're going to find out here in just a second that I'm not necessarily talking about benevolence when we talk about this idea of withholding not. There is another piece of that that we're going to that we're going to glance over and then we're going to move on because we do want to focus on the idea of benevolence but the assumption is is that you have it they're not assuming that you're broke the bible's not assuming that you have nothing to offer it's assuming that you have something to offer and it's saying withhold it not i'd like to say that that the next part of that is pretty interesting because that which is good withhold not good that word good is a noun, and it can mean goods as in goods and services, such as cash or help or benevolent help. Um, it can also mean a good thing. So it doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're always, when we're talking about benevolence, it's not always necessarily about the cash. It's not always necessarily about the money. Sometimes it's about the, the help that you can offer that's external to that. You know, one of the questions that's going to come up here in a little bit, and I'll just jump ahead because it's really relevant to this point, is, is um, well, what if um, I feel like this person that I'm going to give money to, let's say, for instance, that you're walking along the street, there's a homeless person with a I will work for food um, sign, but you know that if you offer him a job, he's not going to come to your house and rake your leaves or anything, right? So you know that he's just trying to play on your sympathy. Um, there's nothing vaguely like concealed about that you 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 know what's up he knows what's up he's just looking for money right so you walk by and you say well this guy is just obviously going to take this money he's going to use it for booze or he's going to use it for this or whatever the case may be and you say i'm not going to give him cash okay well that's fine i mean you, you don't have to give him cash but but what do you have that you can offer him Right? You see, it's not about like if he doesn't need cash, I can just excuse myself from the situation. It's like if you, if you have good in your hands and you're walking by and someone needs that good, then you do not withhold it. It's assuming that you have something to offer, and everybody in this room has something to offer, whether it's a kind word or a hug or taking them out for a cup of coffee or doing something proactive to be useful in the situation as opposed to just walking by and saying, well, I don't have a coin to throw in your bucket or I'm not going to throw a coin in your bucket because you're just going to go buy cigarettes with it, so I'm just going to ignore the situation. That's not a biblical principle. You see, the thing about charity is that you're going to learn is, and the thing about benevolence is, is that it's hard. It's not easy. If it were easy, everyone would do it. It's a pretty good motto to hold into your mind, right? If it's easy, everyone does it. And benevolence is not easy. And sometimes it's hard to kind of determine what the best thing to do in a situation is. It's not always cut and dry, but it's assuming that you have something good to offer right off the bat, whether it's money or services or some type of a word or some type of an encouragement or something to help to lift them up out of their circumstances. The bottom line is, is that you have good to offer. Do not withhold it. Now, this next part is interesting. It's from them do. 
Now, this idea of from them do actually comes from two Hebrew words, and it has nothing to do with deserving anything. This is the thing that comes into our heads when we say, well, to them that it is due. And somehow our minds trigger to this point where it says, oh, them that are due or them that are worthy of it or deserve that help. Like they have to be doing something in order to, to, to garner that help. That's why people hold up the sign that says, I will work for food. Because they know that you think they should be working to earn their money. And maybe they should be working to earn their money. Maybe they can't work to earn their money. Maybe there's some other circumstances that you don't know about. Bottom line is you're not God. You're just you. And God's brought you into the circumstance with somebody that is obviously in need of something. And maybe they're asking for money or they don't need money. They need something else. Will you stop to ask them? Will you stop to do something to them that is due? Now the word due here is interesting because it gives the idea of ownership. It's coming out of a place of ownership. The two words there, the first one is mine, which we've already talked about. Mine means to come out of something. Like from something comes this. And that word do means ownership. So if you have a person that from them is coming ownership, you have two concepts that you can look at. Most commentators kind of build on these two principles. The first one is perhaps it's a debt. We don't like to think about this in this verse, but it can be applied here without breaking any exegetical rules. Out of this person, they own a debt. Don't withhold from them if it's within your power to do so. You know, when you take a debt, you become slave to the debtor. You have to remember that. You relinquish your control over your ability to to say what does and does not happen with that debt. Because the debtor owns the debt. Right? The person that that is that has given you the money, they own the debt. I used to I a long time ago I used to work at a finance company and and part of my job was collecting 60 and 90 day. Uh, delinquencies. And 90 day means that 90 day or beyond. And, and I was a believer at the time, and there's a, there, it's hard to kind of balance the idea of debt and collection of debt and belief and forgiveness and mercy, because in the business world, there's no such thing as forgiveness and mercy when you have a debt. Um, that's why when your bill comes in, they expect it to be paid. And if it's not paid, then there's a late fee, right? And I can't tell you how many times I would call people that were 90, 120, two years, whatever, delinquent, right? And I would say, look, we really need to figure out how to get this debt taken care of. We need to figure out how to get this paid. And I can't tell you how many times somebody told me, well, you can't get blood from a turnip, can you? And there was a few months there where I didn't know what to say to that. You know, it's like, well, okay, I mean, but we still, no. Here's the answer to that question. The person who gave you the money to put you into debt didn't give the money to a turnip. He gave the money to a person that promised to repay it. And so to them who own the the due, who own the debt, to that person, don't withhold good from them if it's in your hand to do so. Now, There's extenuating circumstances that go along with that that you need to be careful of because in a Christian mindset, you would think that if I have a debt and then I go into debt to to do whatever the case is and then I have no money and I can't pay my bill, then that company should just forgive me because that's what Christians do. That's not the way the world operates, guys. And when you go into debt and then you don't have the money to repay, It's wrong for you to be mad at the person who owns the debt because they're calling for the bill to be due. You're slave to that person. You are slave to the debtor. And so you don't have an option. Now, you can work with that person to try and make arrangements. You can work with that person to try and do things. I'm not a big fan of bankruptcy. It's like when you take out a debt... It's your responsibility to take care of that debt. And if you take more debt than you can pay, then whose fault is that? You say, well, they shouldn't have gave me that debt because they knew I couldn't afford it. (laughs) What? 
Well, then if they didn't give it to you, you'd be mad at them that they didn't give it to you. And then when they give it to you, you're mad at it because you can't repay it. I mean, it's like you, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's either one or the other. So that's the first part of that. Now, that's the part we're just going to glance over because that's a, whole, that's a whole different series of things. Now, the other part of that is the ownership of need. To that person that from out of them they own need or want because of circumstance, then don't withhold it from them. This was the most common use of this because of the context of the passage. We're not really talking about the payment of debt in this passage. We're talking about the the treatment of benevolence. And so this is the most common usage of it in this passage. You can talk about the other briefly because it's kind of built in there and it doesn't really break any kind of, uh, of, of rules and trying to define it that way. However, it doesn't fit contextually with what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is that if there is a person that is the owner of poverty, that is the owner of circumstance, that is the owner of need, then withhold not good from that person. Good being a good thing or good being goods and services. It's not wrong to walk up to a person that is in need, whether it is perceived need or whether it is genuine need, you have no way of determining that. Let me put it to you this way, right? So if you walk by a person, they're in need, and they're sitting there, and they have, they, they, uh, they have an obvious need because of the way they appear. And you make a judgment call that this person is just gaming the system. They probably have a Lexus on the other side of the parking lot, and they're just earning this money by sitting here asking people for handouts, right? Panhandler extreme. Okay, well, that's an assumption that you're making. What if you're wrong? What if you're incorrect and this person has two kids at home that they're trying to feed and they lost their job because they have some debilitating or some type of terminal illness? The worst part about benevolence is when we walk into a situation making assumptions or making um, uh, uh, insinuating that there are things going on that may or may not be going on without evidence. And if you want to make a judgment call, on that person's lifestyle, then withholding good from them is not what you need to do. What you need to do is withhold not good from them and invest in their lives to investigate what's going on in their life. But it's the wrong thing to do to just walk away. Now, I'm not saying that you need to go down and drive down to Seattle and walk into the homeless district and walk around and and throw a coin in everybody's bucket, right? Because there is a good, there is a greater good, and there are things that you can do for that group of people that probably could affect the entire group of people more than just walking to each one of them to put a coin in a a cup, right? So you have to be wise in the way that you do this, but what I'm saying is, is that it's not always one or the other. Sometimes there's things that you have to consider. Now the next part of that says, when it is in the power of thine hand to do so. Here again, when it is in thy power... This doesn't really need any exposition, right? I mean, if you have it, don't withhold it. If you don't have it, then you're probably the one that is in need. Don't be afraid to ask for it. This is why a large community of believers is really important. This is why I I, I think that the idea of, of, of people... Um, excluding themselves from a church body in preference of, of smaller groups or individual groups or just their family worshiping at home together and calling that home church. I think the danger in that is that you exclude the community of believers from your circle of influence. And so neither can you help others effectively, but you can't ask for help effectively because you have no communication with those that are outside of you. So you end up withdrawing and holding and storing up things for yourselves. This also brings up an interesting question about prepping, doesn't it? Prepping, why do you prep and who do you prep for? What happens when, you, when the world collapses, right? I have asked this question of preppers, and, and it's funny the responses that you get. 
let's say the world collapses, economic collapse has taken place. And here you are, a family of believers. You have this storehouse of food that's going to last you a year, two years, three years if you're a really good prepper. And you're just sitting there in your mind and your own business, and up walks this family, right, that didn't prepare. And they say, can we have some of your food? What do you do? Well, I mean, as a believer, if you have it in your hand to, to help them, then you can't withhold it from them. Because it's not within your power to do that. God has obviously sent them to you. So you have to take care of it, right? So when you're prepping, who are you prepping for? Are you prepping for just your family? Or are you prepping for your family and the possibility that you might have to help others along the way? You know, the Mormons have a great solution for this. What they do as a church is they prepare as a church. They have warehouses filled with canned goods and dry goods. It's bizarre to us, right? I mean, I got our deacons to help to invest in some poundage of dry food just to put away here at the church somewhere. <laughs> and people were like, why are y'all doing that? Well, because I as an individual, if I'm preparing my family for the worst, I can't afford to prepare for everyone else as well. And if we aren't prepared to take care of ourselves and to take care of those that are around us, then how are we going to minister to these people? There's a lot of questions, isn't there? It's not just black and white. It's pretty complicated. So when it's in your power to do so, do not withhold it. The payment of debt, the giving of alms. Thine hands implicates that it is something that you hold or that you possess. Do it. Just do it. Make it come to pass is what that means. Some of you might even have that written in your Bible in a different version. It might say, if you have it in your hand, give it to them, make it come to pass. It's not an option. This, is like, this isn't like God is giving us this instruction of wisdom, and he's saying, look, if there's a person and, they are the ownership of, and they're in ownership of need, and you have good in your hands, it might be a good idea if you gave them something. It's not like that at all. If you run across someone that is in ownership of need, and you have good in your hands, whether it's goods and services out of your pocket, or whether it is you physically taking them and helping to understand their situation and helping them through a problem, if that's what it is, you have good in your hands to give them, then give it to them, do it. Make it come to pass. It's not an option. Benevolence isn't a thing that a church can choose to do or not do. It is something that we must do. There's some broader political ideas about this as well. I'll get to in a second, which are fun. When you owe a debt, repay it, not repair it. Repairing it, repaying it would be repairing it, actually, so I'm okay there. That was a, I did that on purpose. When you see a need, take care of it. Now, let's talk a moment about the failure of the church in benevolence. They came by it honestly, to be honest. Um, in America, we didn't start off with government social programs. In fact, it was never written into the Constitution nor any of our documentation that we should have government social programs like welfare or Social Security or disability or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are government programs that have been created and that some of us benefit from. And so... They're taking care of a need. But is that the role of government? Is that the role of government? Or is it the role of the church? You see, at one time, the way it was done is, is if there were needs in your community, your church stepped in to take care of your needs. And you belong to a church because the church 
was there not only to support you in fellowship, but to support you in time of need as well. It was a, co- it was a, it was a cooperative of people congregating together for the purpose of worshiping and living together. And as time went on and as churches grew and as the mentality of church changed and it became less and less about people living together as a family, as a communal group of people working together for a common good, for the betterment of our society, for the betterment of our communities, and it became more and more inwardly focused, benevolence dropped off. So less and less people were being taken care of. Now, there was a point in history where everybody, nobody had anything. It's called the Great Depression. And because of that, there was this onslaught of social programs that were generated. And the government began to take benevolence away from the church. And when the government took benevolence away from the church and began to be the agent of benevolence, there was no need for the church to be involved in benevolence because our tax dollars were doing it. Well, when you have a government program that is giving things away, what are you invariably going to have? People that abuse the system. And no way of monitoring or policing it. And so the system grew. The government-mandated, government-funded benevolence of society grew exponentially over time to the point that that it is at today. And with that, guess what else grew? Taxes. And with that, guess what else grew? Poverty. Benevolence is a lot like marriage in that when we as the church allowed the government to begin to license marriage and take the spiritual concept of marriage away from the church and give it to the local magistrate, marriage began to fall fall apart. Care for the homeless, care for people that were in need, same thing. I always challenge people, you tell me one program that the government does well. Just give me one. I'll take any one. The only one they're supposed to be doing, right? So if you look at it from that perspective, then some concepts begin to occur, right? The problem is definitely the problem. The government is not going to take care of social issues, then who will? If the government's not going to issue welfare checks, if the government is not going to issue social security income, if the government is not going to take care of our old people, if the government is not going to take care of our disabled people, if the government is not going to take care of our veterans and our orphans and our widows, then who is going to do it? I mean, we complain about these programs. We fuss about them because they increase our taxes and we don't like the government being involved and they do a terrible job of it and yada, 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 yada. And I hear decades of complaining about the social programs. But you know what I never hear? As I never hear anybody saying, you know what? Let me be involved with making it so the government doesn't have to do that anymore. Because it's going to sacrifice comfort. But we're already being taxed for that. Well, there there you go. Then why should you do anything? Because you're paying the government to do it for you. And you say you're mad about taxes. However, if you want to get away from that, then there is some responsibility that needs to be taken on. Guys, let me tell you something right now. If the government were to shut down all of its social programs tomorrow, there would be people starving to death in the streets. Would there be people that would be just fine because they're abusing the system? Absolutely. But there will be children starving in the streets. Who will do the work? Who will take care of them? 
who will take care of the vet when he's in need, who will take care of the widow when she has an issue, who will take care of the orphan, who will take care of the homeless. Whether you support it or not, Candlelight not too long ago was going to put in this complex of tiny homes for homeless people, right? And there was some debate over whether or not this was a good idea or not, you know I mean? It's like because you're going to put that in there and then there's going to be drug users in there and then there's going to be, you know, maybe crime's going to set in and it's never a good thing. If you look at Seattle, you see how that's done. It's terrible, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we shouldn't do it because it's a terrible thing. Okay, well, let's not do it. Tell me the solution. Don't just complain about the, about the solutions you don't like. Give me a solution. Quit fussing and let's do something about it, right? I mean, for heaven's sake, it's easy for me to get on my Facebook feed and go, that's a dumb idea because of blah, 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 my freedom and blah, 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 and government sucks and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, everybody knows that. Nobody cares about why you disagree with it. Tell me what to do to fix it. When it is in your hands to do good, and you run across the person that needs good given to them, make it happen. That's it, period. Now it goes on because, oh, I didn't even get into any of this. With church set for the void, the government fails to help, homeless, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Are we willing to help pay the cost in our community? That's the sacrifice part. Are we willing to help pay the cost? Are we willing to sacrifice? You know, it's funny because, like, when, 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 Organizations like nonprofit organizations and stuff, they start talking about, hey, can we, we can help the homeless. You know, let's, let's just all give up one latte a week. And we can do so much. And it's like, people feel so noble. I gave up my latte to feed a homeless child. Not even letting it sink in for just a moment. That you will go home tonight and you will open up your fridge and you will get out of it anything that you want to eat. And while you're doing that and you sit down on your counter and you are cutting your pork chop or you're cutting your piece of meat or you're eating your sandwich or you're eating your nutritarian grain bin, whatever it is, I don't know, what is it? Uh, some kind of... Some kind of wacko diet Richard's on now. <laughs> While you're doing that, remember that as you are feeding yourself, there is in this country somewhere a child that has not eaten in a week. Just, just think about that. M maybe I can do more than a latte. Now, if you are a member or an attender here and you are giving to this congregation... I want you to know that, gosh, 10% of our budget last year went out in benevolence. No, more than that. Closer to 15% of our, of our budget that came in went out to help people. So you're doing something, guys. Don't beat yourself up too bad. Because you are doing something. If you're, if, you're, if you're putting something in the offering plate, you're doing something. But is it enough? I, I always wonder, you know, about things. Like, what's the solution? Like, I was just, I was looking this morning, you know, because there's this mass exodus from Facebook and everything. And, and I, I'm inclined to fight it out. But in being inclined to fight it out, you know, I'm looking, I'm trying to find information on, you know, short of leaving, how do you fight it? 
you know, what, how, what's, what can you do that's the most effective way to fight against censorship, to fight against the theft of freedom of speech? What's the best way to go about that? It's the same thing with the homeless situation and with people, fatherless children, and, you know, all, all those things that go along with that. It's like, I can make a difference. What's the best way to do that? Say not unto thy neighbor, go and come again, and tomorrow I will give thee when thou hast it by thee. That neighbor part is the Hebrew word for an associate or a companion. This is someone that you know. So now, not only are we talking about them who it is due or the owner of need or the owner of, of want, we're talking about people that you may actually know that are the owners of need and want. And so it's kind of like the part two of, of, the, of the next level of this. It means that, that that whole idea of say unto your neighbor, that's to charge or to certify or make a declaration unto, the, unto your neighbor. And that declaration is go, come again tomorrow. Although the exegetical concept of this is pretty clear, it's kind of packed with implications and assumptions, Okay. So when you look at your neighbor and you have it in your hand to give it to them, let's bear that in mind, it's not like this is a, you know, a situation where you don't have anything to give to them. You have good to offer, your neighbor has come to you, they've asked for good, and now you're going to say, oh, go and come again tomorrow and we'll take care of it tomorrow. This isn't a like, I got to run to the bank situation, this is a like, I have something to offer but I'm not going to come back tomorrow. Why you're doing that, I don't know. Maybe you're hoping that they don't come back tomorrow. Or maybe you're hoping that in the process of waiting for tomorrow that somebody else comes along to help them. The bottom line is if you have it in your hand and you turn them away, then it's just selfish by nature. So you're making a few uh, assumptions here. First of all, the assumption number one that you're making is that their assumption that their need is something that can wait. You know, if they're a little bit hungry... You know, that can wait till tomorrow, no big deal. You know? Well, they need to have their car fixed, that can wait till tomorrow, it's no big deal. Well, unless he, they lose their job. You know, you're making assumptions about things that you don't have any idea about what's going on. You're just assuming when you say that, you know, it's like, well, come back tomorrow and let's see if you still have that need. No, that, you're making some terrible assumptions. You're not testing to see if the need is real. You're actually putting them at risk, and we're going to get that in just a second. The next one is the assumption that they have somewhere to go. You're assuming that when you tell them to go away that they have a home to go to or some place to go to or some place to retreat to, a place of solitude or solace, of security. That might not be the case. It's like walking by the person who's starving on the street they have no shoes on, and you look at them and say, okay, well, if you're here tomorrow, I'll help you. Or you could go to Ross and buy him a pair of shoes. That, but Ross is all the way across town. You're right. You're right. It's too much work. Three, the implication that their need is not dire. Remember, it is in your hand to do it, but you're choosing to refrain from giving it to them because of X, Y, and Z. It's not like I said before. It's not like you're just having to run to the bank real quick. It's that you're choosing to not give it to them to wait until tomorrow to try out some kind of theory or whatever. Or maybe you just don't want to. Or maybe they won't be there. Right? Number four, the assumption that there will be tomorrow. It's a big one. You have the opportunity to create a blessing today in the power and the will of God and to glorify God in your works. You have the power to do that today, and by walking by and saying, no, I'll do it tomorrow, what you're doing is you're procrastinating into a tomorrow that you have no guarantee of. I mean, let's just not even talk about the rapture, right? Because that's an easy one. Like, if you get raptured tomorrow or the, the rapture takes place, then yeah, you, you have lost your, your ability to be able to give to them, right? And we know that if, they, or if you walk by and then you say, I'll take care of it tomorrow, and then they get ran over by a bus, right? Well, guess what? You've lost the opportunity to be a blessing to them. 
and potentially the opportunity to share the gospel with them. Which, if that's the case, then you may have unduly put them into a desperate situation of dire consequences. When thou hast it in your hands, when you have it, by implication, you're holding it just like in number three. You have it, their need is dire. You have it in your hand. You have the opportunity to do something, but you choose not to. If that's the case, then there is no way that there should be any excuse that you should do that for them. Yeah, you know, you're walking by. Maybe you don't have any cash on you. Maybe you stop and you say, hey, what can I do for you? I don't have any cash, but what can I do for you? And then they say, man, I could really use a cup of coffee. So you take them across the street to a McDonald's, you buy them a cup of coffee. You sit down and chat for a little while. I can't tell you how many times I've passed up on opportunities to help people because I just didn't have the time. We're all guilty of that. I know we're all guilty of that. It's, it, it, it's very difficult to live a lifestyle of complete sacrifice when we just have so much going on. But now I'm reading this and I'm thinking back to all those times that I had the opportunity to help somebody or I had the opportunity to give something to someone or I had the opportunity to help someone out and I chose not to do it because I just said, just wait until tomorrow. I got stuff going on today. Just wait until tomorrow and I'll get to you tomorrow. But then you never see that person again. And maybe somebody came along and helped them. Maybe somebody did something. You know, I don't know. You know, maybe, maybe God in his providence gave them somebody along the way that came by and helped them. Praise the Lord. Guess what? I didn't get to be involved with it. I didn't get to share in that blessing. I didn't get to experience it. I didn't get the opportunity to give the glory to God. Instead, I have to look to God and make excuses about why I didn't do it. And our excuses are invalid. Devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. That word devise not is to fabricate, to invent, or to concoct. Typically, with deceitful intent. This idea of devising not. Now, we're kind of getting away a little bit from this uh, idea of, of benevolence a little bit to talk about security and safety a little bit. But it has to relate somehow. Like, somehow we, we've conned from, to them that it is due, withhold not. And also, with your neighbor, if they come, don't say come again tomorrow. If it's in your hand, to give it to them. Um, don't deny them. Um, and now all of a sudden it's like devise not evil against your neighbor. Well, what are we talking about? How is, how is that related to not having benevolence for someone? How am I, if I am a person that has the ability to give someone, to some, someone something and I choose not to do it because either I don't have time or I just don't want to have to deal with it or I don't believe that they deserve it, um, then how is that devising evil against this person that I know? Well, I think it comes from the secret sauce, which is the next words. And the next words are not evil. Now, that word, devise not evil, the, the not evil part in this context is to construct or to build their calamity, their demise, or their distress. When you have good to offer and you have a person that has a need for good and you choose to withhold good for whatever reason then what he's saying is, is that you're, there's a possibility that you might be devising their demise. You might be constructing or building upon the idea of their calamity or the idea of their demise. Instead of being that person that walks along and says, I don't have much, but what I have, I give it to you. This person that dwells securely by you. 
This references that they are not just close to you in proximity, but they're actually related to you in some way, friendship or, or family or close acquaintance, someone that you know very personally. It's like, devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing or understanding that they dwelleth securely by you. That idea of dwelling securely by a person is that you not only are, are literally close to them, but that you are united with them in some way, some type of a relationship, and that they trust you. They trust you. They may not like you, but they trust you. There's a certain amount of security or safety they found in that relationship. It could be a child, could be a, a parent, could be a grandparent, could be a niece, a nephew, an uncle, could be anything. Could be just a close friend that has done a really good job of messing their life up. Withhold not good from them, because if you withhold good from them, there is a possibility that you are devising their calamity. And when you do it on purpose, it's almost deceitful. Well, it's not almost deceitful. It is scripturally deceitful to tell a person, no, I'll come back tomorrow, right? Because you have it in your hand. You're lying to them. You're de deceitfully constructing their demise. That's a terrifying thought, isn't it? It's like, well, I didn't put them in that situation. Well, let's get to the what ifs because this is the good part. What if, because every time we're introduced with the option to be able to give good to someone when we have good in our hands and we don't withhold it, when we're given that, that opportunity and we're looking at that bum that's on the street with his can in front of him and we, we come up with all these scenarios, well, what if? All right, so what if they're just going to go buy booze and drugs? What about that? Yeah, like, should I give them money if they're just going to go buy booze and drugs? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you know that they're going to go buy booze and drugs? Do you have evidence? Can you show me that this is what they are going to do? Can you foretell the future? Wait a minute. You must be God. Because you know what's going to happen. This is, again, that part where you're making assumptions about the process before you actually take advantage of the process to, take, to do the good thing that you are, are given to do. Well, let's say, for instance, that you do know. I've done this before with this person. They take it. They go buy drugs and booze. Okay. Then what? It's still in your hands. The good is still there. The ability is still present. That hasn't changed. This person is still in need, whether it is forced or whether it is part of their own decisions. It doesn't make a difference. God doesn't put any qualifications on the do part. Here they are. What do you do? Well, I know that he's going to go buy booze and drugs and make this situation worse. What can I do to help? And then that's where it costs you time. The reason we like the part about the booze and drugs part is because it gives us an excuse to not do the easy thing. The easy thing is to just go try and drop a $5 bill in there and walk off. That's the easy thing to do. And we like that because we like easy because it's cheaper to get put $5 in there than to spend the next two hours going and buying him a Big Mac. Maybe he is going to go buy drugs and booze. Well, if you fill his belly with soup, then you don't have to worry about what he's doing with it because it's already there. And I can assure you, you're not going to want it back. Right? So there's that. What if they are gaming the welfare system and having children just to get a bigger check? Jerks. Gaming the welfare system. Yep, it's nefarious, it's wrong, 
it is also very smart. Criminals aren't stupid. People that do bad things aren't stupid. They know the rules. They know the welfare rules better than you'll ever know them. I can assure you of that. So you have this young lady who has 15 kids living in a low-income apartment. Her 15th kid, or her first kid, is now old enough to take care of the bottom half of the kids. And so now they've gotten to a point where they have all these kids, and the kids are taking care of the kids, and all that she's got to do is sit back and soak in the massive welfare check that comes in every month and live in the low-income housing. What a life. Good for her. She's gaming the system. Does that change her situation? No, in fact, it makes it more tragic. Because she's perceiving that she's receiving help when in all actuality, what she is actually doing is she's actually being subjected to the tyranny of low expectations. Is it in our hands to help her? And what does that help look like? Can we just dismiss it because we don't like what she's doing? The answer to that question is no. There's no qualifications on benevolence. There is a need. There are people in that household that have a need. We have good in our hands. It is our responsibility to give them help. Now, that help can be used wisely. It can be used lazily. Like we could just throw some money at it just like the government does, but guess what? That might not be the best answer. The best answer might be we can help you out financially, but let us help you get a job. Let us help you find some health care. Let us find you, help you find some daycare. Let us help you rise out of your circumstances as opposed to just pumping money into the system to keep you in it. Right? There's a lot of things you can do, but do you have good in your hands? And do you reject it just because this person is gaming the system? By the way, there's plenty of us in this room that game the system every year. A lot of you guys, like myself, receive a pretty tidy refund check on your taxes every year. Because you're in this income bracket, right? And there's this thing called unearned income And so if you are at a certain poverty level, right, you can benefit. I don't like it, but I'm not opposed to getting that check every year. Some of you guys are paying for my refund. Thank you. (laughs) It really is obnoxious, right? But that's what government systems are. They're they're there to be gamed. It is a game. And how you play the game is how you end up in the end. And the loopholes are there to be utilized. It's like when people get irritated that business owners can write off so much in their businesses and dodge taxes. They're like, Well, that's not right. They shouldn't be able to do that. Why not? It's written into the tax code. It's totally legal. It's a loophole. If you're smart enough to do it, go for it. Well, that's not what you'd like to hear, is it? There's no easy answers when it comes to all of this stuff. And it's easy to get bitter about helping people and about being a part of people's lives. But we must do it nonetheless. What if they're terrible with money and they keep wasting it? Some of you guys have helped family members in this situation before. Where you've helped them out and they've wasted it and frittered it away. And then you helped them out and then they wasted it and they frittered it away. And they helped them out and and they wasted it and frittered it away. Maybe one of those times you can get ahead of the curve and help them. And then also say, you have to get into financial counseling if I'm going to help you again. Help doesn't always have to be a dollar bill. Good doesn't always have to be a thing. Good can sometimes be good things that come from our hearts. That's sometimes the best thing you can give to someone. 
But do we just tell them to go away? We can't do that. We can't just say, oh, I'll go and, and come again tomorrow. And then maybe I'll be able to help you. Nope, that's not an option. I'm running way behind. What if I know that the money is not the answer? Well, if you know that money is not the answer, then what's the right thing to do? Do the good thing that is not money. Remember that being due has nothing to do with deserving a thing, but is the condition of owning a circumstance that may or may not have been out of their control. There's no qualifications on the need for benevolence. There's no precursors to a person deserving our good nature. Just like we didn't deserve the mercy and the grace of God, but we're extended it anyways to pay a debt that we could never pay on our own through the blood of Jesus Christ. We also see people that do not deserve oftentimes the help that we give them, but we give it to them nonetheless because guess what? God loves that person. And he loves us and he wants us to be in his will and to follow through in the character of Christ. And that's what we do. Here's another what if. What if churches and believers stepped up to the plate in a very real way, helped those in need of all kinds? What if we accepted the sacrifice? What if we lived less comfortably for the sake of others? I'm not talking about sacrificing a latte. I'm talking about cutting off your cable television. I'm talking about those excesses that we potentially don't need that we could cut away and that we could utilize that to help the people that are in need in our community. I wish I was better at this. I wish I was better at helping. I really, I really do. I wish I was better at being compassionate. I'm not a compassionate person by nature. I know that comes as a shock to a lot of you. I'm not a compassionate, compassionate person. I had one feeling a couple of decades ago, and then it got hurt, and now I have none. That's not true, because I do care deeply for people. I'm not really good at showing it, but I do care deeply for people. And I know that this year, you know, as we're talking about this move away from the convention and we're talking about, you know, having a little bit of extra missions money in our hand, I, I want to know what we're going to do with it. I want to know that it's going out. I don't want it to be utilized for some kind of thing in the church that benefits us, you know, more lights or you know, a fog machine or, you know, some other kind of nonsense, right? I want it to go into the hands of the people that need it because it is in our hand to do so. And to do otherwise would be wrong. We should be looking in our community and there should not be, there should not be any hungry people in our immediate vicinity. If we could get up on our roof and we could look around with an eye shot of what we're looking at, there should be no hungry people. The problem is, is that when you begin to advertise that kind of stuff, guess what happens? People come to game the system. You kind of have to be okay with that. I know it sucks. It's not something that you want to think about. They're just going to take this Super One gift card and they're going to buy cigarettes with it. We should call Super One and tell them that if they get a gift card from Athol Baptist Church, they can only use it to buy staple goods on an approved list. Well, that's fine if that's the good thing that you want to do. Just Bear in mind that it's going to take a lot of work, and you have to be willing to commit to that work. And it might be the best thing for that person, actually. But that being said, it's going to take effort on your part to make that happen. 
Ken, bless his heart, he's in charge of benevolence here at Athel Baptist Church. Ken, raise your hand. He's a deacon in charge of benevolence. He just wrote a thousand-page policy on benevolence and the process of giving away benevolence because it is that complicated. I'd actually, I don't even know how many pages it is, but it's a lot. It's, ex- it's exhaustive and exhausting. I think it's the biggest policy that we have. It might be the biggest policy we have, isn't it? Maybe child protection is bigger. Oh, did you streamline it? Good job. It's absolutely necessary, though, because in the effort to do benevolence, we don't get to choose to not do something. There is a... When I, when I was over at my friend's house the other night, we were talking about music, and it came to my attention that one of his kids is a big fan of Pink Floyd. I also am a big fan of Pink Floyd. I listened to Pink Floyd when I was a teenager and, and as I was growing up, and they have a song that is probably one of the most underrated songs that they have ever put out, and it's called On the Turning Away. It's on the Momentary Lapse of Reason album. And one of those lines in that song is, it's a shame that somehow light has turned into shadow and casted a shroud over all we have known. And when I think of light, the only thing that I can think of is we are the light of the world. And somehow we became so consumed with materialism that we became the shadow. And as that shadow of materialism grew in our hearts, it cast a shroud over all that we know so that people don't trust the church anymore. They don't trust Christ anymore. You saw the graph if you came to the services or the the meeting yesterday. It's just downhill. For the last 15 years, it's been downhill. It's not because there's any shortage of people that need Christ. It's because there is an abundance of Christians who are inundated with materialism. We have to have our part. We have to have our due. We have to have our things. (sighs) We got a lot of work to do. And we're not going to solve all the world's problems. We're not going to help all the homeless people in the world. We're not going to help all the widows and the orphans in the world. But we have some here. And it's our job to take care of them. Whatever that looks like. And that's what we will do. Will you partner with us to do that? You know, as you're writing your offering check or whatever the case may be, and you want to take a portion of that and say, look, I want to I make sure that this much gets into benevolence. That really helps. We had a, a really nice check come in last week for benevolence. And that entire check is going to go to someone in need. No, bureau, no bureaucracy, no red tape, no political wrangling, Nope, that money goes in the doors, then goes out the doors. This is what we do. Join with us in that as we care for those. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for giving us so much. Everyone within the sound of my voice here this morning has so much to offer, whether it is finances or whether it is time, whether it is experience, we have so much to offer. We have so much good in our hands, Father. I pray that you would inspire us to not withhold it, to not hold it back, to not deny it to those that are out there in need. And Father, we will give you all the glory for it. In your son's name we pray, amen.